Well, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 63 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of June 28th through July 4th. Happy July 4th. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour I'm going to be ranting away, being uh, your raconteur, talking about things that I think are worthy of your intention. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show, any plaudits, brickbats, tidbits, whatever, uh, you can, you should, in fact, email me directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, as I never think you do, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be up here a couple of times during the show, somewhere around there. Um, and you can uh, go there and get the email address directly from there. I do answer my email. Um, sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer my email. Uh, the only thing I ask, please be sure that if you send me email, that in the subject line you include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that so that I know it's not spam. So, uh, with that, we will get started. Uh, I'm going to start with something. It's, it's beginning to look like the previously known as the Clown Award at the Clarabelle Award um, is... Um, well, it's, it's, it's given for particularly clownish things. Um, it appears it's going to become like, like a regular feature here at Left Side of the Aisle. It wasn't intended to be. It was intended for just the occasional situation as it arose, but I'm discovering there are just too many clowns out there. Uh, I'll start, however, by noting that last week's recipient, a guy named Eric Hovda, he's a uh, Gopper senatorial wannabe in Wisconsin, uh, he was honored for a statement that he wanted the media to stop publishing what he called sob stories about people who are struggling in the recession and its dead focus on the deficit. This week he, con he confirmed that he deserved the award. Uh, Representative Tammy Baldwin is the presumptive Democratic nominee for the same Senate seat, and he called her a communist. Now, he's, he's not the only, he's not the first gopper or the only gopper to have used the term, apparently without any concept of what it actually means. You might remember that um, Representative Alan West, the gift that keeps on giving, that Alan West claimed that about 80 Democratic members of the House of Representatives are members of the Communist Party. And I have to admit, I had the same reaction to Hovda as I did to West. Communist? What decade are you living in? But, to turn to this week's dishonoree, he is Representative Joe Uli Walsh. There's this bill called the DREAM Act. Uh, this provides a path to citizenship for undocumented uh, uh, immigrants who are brought here as children, who have grown up here, uh, and they identify culturally and politically as Americans, um, but who aren't citizens, but they identify themselves as Americans. And uh, if they meet certain requirements, that, again, this provides a path to citizenship for them. This bill has been introduced in every Congress since 2001 and has been blocked every time. Now, bluntly, I find the idea that this very simple, this very humane bill, I mean, remember, these people regard themselves as Americans. They've grown up here. But the idea that you're going to prevent them from being able to become citizens, I find this, this notion both astonishing and, frankly, is proof of how much racist xenophobia is driving our immigration debate. Well, in August 2011, the Obama administration announced that it was going to use prosecutor, prosecutorial excuse me, discretion uh, in dealing with deportations. Put simply, the federal government was going to decline to prosecute people for deportation, decline to continue deportation proceedings against people who would have been eligible under the DREAM Act had the bill actually passed. Recently, the White House announced it was going to continue that policy for another two years. And the right wing, either not knowing or not caring that that's, this had been the policy for the previous 10 months, went totally berserk. Uh, and this is where Joey Boy enters the story. Now, first you have to know clearly, prosecutors have discretion. 
prosecutorial discretion to determine where they're going to focus their energies, what cases they're going to prosecute, what cases they're going to let slide. They have this, there's no question about this, which means there is no question but that what the Obama administration has done here is legal. It is within their lawful powers. This is just not in dispute. So whether you approve of that decision or not, and in fact I do approve, um, the fact whether you do or not is irrelevant. It is legal. So what does Representative Joe Washed Up do? He goes to a town hall event and says Obama is a tyrant. I don't know what else you call him. He is a tyrant, in other words, according to Joe Washed Up, for using his unquestionably legal powers to do the right thing. Well, a uh, campaign representative for uh, Mr. Washed Up, a guy named Christian Morgan, said, Joe calls them as he sees them. <laughs> yeah, so did Mr. Magoo, you clown. You and your boss both. Okay, something else in immigration here, um, since we're talking about Im immigration. The other day in a five to three decision, the Supreme Court upheld the core provision of Arizona's infamous SB 1070, the xenophobic immigration law that's become known as the Papers Please Law. That core provision requires state law enforcement to demand immigration papers from anyone stopped, detained, or arrested who the cops reasonably suspect is in the country without proper authorization. It also requires police to check with the feds on the immigration status of anyone they arrest before they release them. Now this case arose because the Obama administration said that this law usurped federal authority on the area of immigration policy and enforcement. Now the decision then of the Supreme Court of course was met with wild celebration on the right and as a rebuke to Obama's desire to I don't know, I, I, to, to allow the brown hordes to overrun our great white nation or something, I don't know. But the thing was, it was not as much of a victory for them or a loss for rationality as might initially appear. First, uh, the decision on the papers please provision revolved around the technical question I just mentioned of whether or not it usurps federal authority. Uh, the majority of the court found that it wasn't clear whether this supplanted or supported federal policy. Remember, the law has not gone into effect yet. Because of the legal challenges, the implementation of the law has been delayed. So the court said, we can't tell. That's what they said. So they let the law stand for now. But the ruling also said, I'm quoting, this opinion does not foreclose other preemption and constitutional challenges to the law as interpreted and applied after it goes into effect. So when Arizona does, as it inevitably will, begin to target Latinos, well, then the challenge can be renewed. And indeed, there are already other suits against this law that have been filed uh, against it on constitutional grounds, including free speech, um, equal protection, and due process issues. And the thing is, what's more, even, though, e even as it withheld, for now, the core provision of SB 1080, the court struck down three other provisions uh, as stepping on federal prerogatives. One of those, uh, two of those provisions, rather, made it a crime for undocumented immigrants to be in Arizona or to seek employment in Arizona, and a third authorized police officers to make warrantless arrests of anyone they reasonably believed had committed a deportable offense. So, frankly, this wasn't nearly the victory for vindictiveness or the, uh, or the loss for logic, as might first appear, which I would say marks it as, well, not as good news, but at least is not all bad news. By the way, there's a sidebar here. Uh, Antonin Scalia, to what should have been no one's surprise, dissented, saying he would have held, upheld all four provisions of the law. He delivered an oral summary in which he said that Arizona is, I'm quoting him here, entitled to impose additional penalties and consequences for violation of federal immigration laws because it is entitled to have its own immigration laws. Now, I want to repeat that just to make sure it registered. Antonin Scalia is arguing that states are entitled to their own immigration laws. Now just for a minute, think about what that means. Think about what that actually means. According to Antonin Scalia, every state is entitled to control who comes into that state and whether or not they're allowed to live there. Any state, for example, Arizona, could establish its own passport system 
if it wanted to. Any state could set up roadblocks along its entire border and turn away anybody that didn't have the state's required papers with them. Any individual state could establish a quota system and say, for example, well, you can't live here because we've already taken in our quota of blacks or Latinos or women or whatever for this year. That's what Antonin Scalia is saying when he said states can have their own immigration laws. So I'm, I'm sorry, but where does this idea that, Ant, uh, that Antonin Scoliosis is some great legal mind? I mean, his opinions are usually just ideologically driven right-wing mush with a, a heaping of bile and a susan of sarcasm or spleen. Where does this great legal mind business come from? I, I have to admit, I just don't know. I really don't. But since we're talking about the Supreme Court, we're going to move on from there to something also about the Supreme Court, our regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Now, I know you've heard of the Citizens United decision. This is the one where the supine court, bowing as it always does to the desires of corporate America, essentially stripped away controls on unlimited monies pouring into federal elections. Now, I still predict, as I have since the day that it was elected, that if we do manage to survive as a democracy, that at some point in our future, this decision will, become, uh, will come to be regarded with the same disdain as the Dred Scott decision is today, as one of the worst decisions in the court's entire history. But several months ago, Montana, the Montana State Supreme Court, upheld a state law it's a century-old law in Montana that says, and I'm quoting, a corporation may not make an expenditure in connection with a candidate or a political committee that supports or opposes a candidate or political party. In short, basically corporations have to stay out of politics. Now the corporate clowns and cronies, of course, appealed this decision to the Supreme Court. Now, most people predicted the, the, the Supremes would sing their standard song, whatever corporations want, corporations get and overturn the ruling and therefore invalidate the state law under challenge. Which, in a 5-4 decision on June 25th, they did. In fact, they were so eager to do so, so eager to do the bidding of the corporations, that the decision was announced now, even though it wasn't expected until after the fall elections. It was announced with, basically within a couple of months of when the petition first reached the court. And more than that, they dismissed the entire case in a single paragraph. In eight sentences, precisely eight sentences, they dismissed it out of hand. Of course Citizens United overrules you. So just, of course it does. What's more, they said, quoting here, Montana's, or this is one of those eight sentences, Montana's arguments in support of the judgment below either were already rejected in Citizens United or failed to meaningfully, meaningfully distinguish that case. That statement is wrong on both counts. It's so wrong, in fact, that it's hard to think that it's accidental. First, the case clearly was distinguishable from Citizens United on two grounds. One, it was state election law. It was not federal law. The general tradition has been for states to, to, to for the federal courts to let states regulate their own elections uh, with the Fed stepping in only when some identifiable group of voters was being denied access to the polls, which it clearly isn't here unless the majority of the Supreme Court wants corporations to be able to vote, which it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Second, and this is critical, part of the, if I can stretch the word far enough, logic of Citizens United was the claim that evidence of the corrupting influence of money in politics was lacking. Okay, I'm going to give you a second to let you recover yourselves. But that's what they said. Well, the Montana decision was evidence-based. It was based on Montana's experience of having the copper industry uh, interest, the copper industry, essentially buying elections in Montana. It was based on actual experience. To overturn the ruling then, the Supreme Court, the majority of the Supreme Court, either had to deny that history or deny the relevance of facts. Probably both. As a footnote to this, you know all those super PACs uh, raising all that unlimited money in this year's presidential race as a result of Citizens United? A few months ago, 
According to an analysis of their financial reports at the time by USA Today, just under 25% of the entire amount raised by all of these super PACs had been put up by precisely five incredibly rich people. But, the Supreme Court tells us, there's no evidence that money plays a role in politics. No, I'm beginning to think I should treat the Supreme Court like a, uh, like a five-time Jeopardy champ, like, you know, they're no longer eligible to compete. But right now, once again, the Supreme Court of the United States is the outrage of the week. And we are going to take a break. Here we are, back. Um... Okay, I'm going to go through other things. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the economy. Now, you may not know the exact figures I'm going to be citing, but you will know the experience of it. You'll, you'll know the feel of it. And then I'm going to connect that economy to something that I bet a lot of you have not thought about. I'm going to start with the fact that according to the Federal Reserve, Americans saw their median net worth plummet nearly 40% between 2007 and 2010. Median net worth crashed down to the level of 1992, which means that the, the, you know, the, 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 the um, banking meltdown wiped out two decades of economic gains. And who was hurt the most? Surprise, the middle class. See, the poor didn't have really much left to lose. And the richest among us, hey, here's another shocker, it actually rose slightly. It rose slightly while everyone else was falling off a cliff. And this happened because the Federal Reserve, with strong bipartisan support in the White House and in Congress, used hundreds of billions of dollars in public money to save the banks and the corporations while ignoring their victims. The inevitable and obvious result? The rich got richer and the poor got poorer, without any fun in the meantime. Just one example, just to give you one example of how this is working. 2011 proxy statements have now been filed for all the major corporations, so you can see how executive pay went last year. Median pay of the nation's 200 top-rated CEOs was $14.5 million a year, and that represented an average pay rise of 5%. Did your pay go up 5% last year? At the same time, corporate profits are rising and rising and rising and rising again. Okay, I want you to bring up graphic two. Okay, bring up graphic two. This is a graph showing overall corporate profits from the mid-1940s through 2011. The gray bars, the vertical gray bars, are times of recession. All right, notice a couple of things. Notice, one, how dramatically corporate profits have been rising since 2000. And how, note in this recession, when the, when the meltdown hit, corporate profits plummeted to the level of several years before and then rebounded so quickly that the down and the up are essentially a single line. And third, notice how corporate profits are now the highest they have ever been. The Fortune 500 generated a total of $824.5 billion in earnings last year. That was an increase of 16.5% over 2010. Did your earnings go up 16.5% last year? All right, go to graphic three. This is another way of expressing the same idea. This this is a graph of corporate profits as a percentage of gross national product, or GDP. That is, as a percentage of the total economy. Again, notice the dramatic rise after 2000. Notice the dramatic dip and almost instantaneous recovery in 2007, to, uh, 2008 rather, and the fact that, again, they are now higher than ever. No matter how you measure it, whether you measure it in dollars or whether you measure it in portion of the economy, corporate profits are the highest they have ever been. All right, now go to graphic four. Okay. This graph shows wages, wages as a percentage of gross domestic product, of GDP. That is, wages as a portion of the entire economy. In this case, notice how the line starts to drop 
after 2000, and that there was no recovery from the latest recession. In fact, it's continued to drop to its lowest level ever. So bluntly, simply put, corporations are making more and more while the rest of us are making less and less. Oh, no, but we've been told, oh no, actually the problem, it's all about productivity. That's the problem, that's the real deal. Yeah, that's a crock. Graphic five. The blue line shows the change in GDP per capita, that is per person. And the red line shows the change in median household income. Both of these lines start in 1989, and they assume 100 as their starting point. Now remember, these lines do not display you know, specific figures. They represent how figures have changed over time. The point is the blue line, GDP per capita, is actually a pretty good uh, uh, measure of productivity. When the productivity is actually measured in worker output per hour, but this is a, a good enough approximation. So you can see how productivity has been rising. Not steadily, but rising overall, but median income has not. We have been increasingly productive as workers, but have not received the benefit of that increased productivity. Where is that benefit gone? <laughs> Go back to graphic two. That's where it's gone. All right, take all those down. Take those graphics down. That's where we stand. The question is why? I'm going to give you a reason why, one I bet most of you have not thought about. Today's depressed wages can be ascribed to a variety of causes, from globalization, offshoring, to new technologies that replace workers. But economists and scholars also point to another cause, the dramatic decline in union membership in the United States in the past 60 years. That has left ordinary workers without a powerful uh, public advocate, or a voice in the workplace, or an effective voice in their wages and working conditions. In the 1950s, the time people now look back to with nostalgia for its st strong and secure economy, labor unions were a dominant force in the economy. More than a third of American workers were unionized. Now, no more than 12% are unionized, um, and only 7% of private workers are unionized. What does this mean to you? Bring up graphic six. This is what it means to you. The red line is the rate of union membership as a portion of the total workforce. The blue line is the share of the total national income going to the middle class. For 40 years now, the two have been declining in tandem. As union membership shrinks, so does the middle class. That's what it means to you. And think about this. Last week I was talking about the attacks on, on pension plans of public workers and how the reason they are often better than those in private industry is that those in private industry used to be as good. The gaps because the benefits of public workers have not declined as much as those in private industry have. And public workers are among the most unionized sectors in the entire economy. About 37% of public workers are unionized. How good are workers, uh, unions for workers? Studies say that in terms of wages, being a union member is roughly equal to having a college degree. Union membership in the private sector increases the workers' compensation between 10 and 20%. All right, you can take that down now. Take that down now. Benefits of collective bargaining even go beyond the unionized workplaces to non-unionized workplaces. As unions raise wages and improve working conditions and benefits for workers in unionized plants, that pulled up wages and the rest of it for people in non-unionized plants because their employers had to at least go some way toward matching the union level in order to keep people working for them. But as labor unions have declined, their power to affect not only their own wages, but those across the economy has also declined. An increasing share of that income has gone to the richest of us, which has led to the largest income gap in more than a century. All right, just consider, one of my all-time favorite bumper stickers read, Unions, the people who brought you the weekend. More than that, overtime, sick leave, workplace safety laws, child labor laws, social security, workers' comp, the minimum wage, unemployment, it's hard to find a single progressive change in the last century that even touches on economics where unions have not had a leading hand. Oh, but now we're told unions are passe, they're corrupt, they're unnecessary. Maybe they were at some time, but they're not now. Blah, blah, more blah. Thing is, just remember who's telling you that. 
Go back to graphic two. It's these people who are telling you that. And if you think you could look at that and then look at graphic four, bring up graphic four, you look in graphic two and then look at graphic four and tell us you think there's nothing more to do, then I can only despair for our future as a nation. All right, that's it. Uh, last thing, very quickly. Um, this is uh, our occasional feature for things not political. Uh, it's called And Another Thing. I wanted to make two, uh, here I want to make two, to, two RIPs of different sorts. The first one is kind of sad, but it's not really tragic. Um, uh, after more than 30 years, Matt Greening is ending his comic strip, Life in Hell. Uh, Life in Hell was a comic strip word popularized, uh, uh, populated by rather anthropomorphic rabbits and a pair of gay lovers. And it was really the strip that created the opening for other strips to get into newspapers, especially alternate weeklies, things like This Modern World, Tom the Dancing Bug, things like that. Life in Hell is what opened the door for them. Now, you may not know Life in Hell, but you know Matt Groening. For one thing, he's co-creator of one of my guilty pleasures, the animated cartoon series Futurama. But before that, back in 1985, an actor uh, producer named James Brooks saw a Life in Hell strip and wanted Groening to um, use the characters to develop a series of what are called bumpers, little featurettes, for the Tracy Ullman show. Groening was worried about the prospect of losing the rights to his characters through this deal, so instead he created a whole new set of characters for that purpose. They were called The Simpsons. The other RIP is a sad one. Carolyn John has died in London at the age of 71. Now I know most of you have no idea who Carolyn John is, and even after I tell you, a lot of you still will have no idea who she was. But no matter, those of you who do find that the name rings a bell might be reminded by this picture. Carolyn John played Liz Shaw, a companion to Doctor Who during the John Pertwee era in the early 1980s. For you poor benighted souls who have no idea who Doctor Who is, he's the one in the middle. Doctor Who, a time-traveling alien who can regenerate his body 12 times for a total of 13 lives, is now on his 11th incarnation in what is the longest-running sci-fi fantasy series in TV history. It has been on the air for over 30 years. Carol and John was only on for one season in that time, just 25 episodes. But out of that time, no Whovian worth the name and by the way, you didn't really think that my email name, Hoovieating, came out of nowhere, did you? Uh, no Hoovian worth the name does not recall Liz Shaw. So RIP, Carol and John. So I think that's it for me for today. I think I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I just wanted to let you again know that, uh, you know, be sure to contact me. You certainly can. Um, Hoviating at AOL.com. I, I welcome your responses. Good, bad, ugly. Good is, of course, most, most fun, but, you know, whatever. Uh, if you got any little news bits or whatnot that you think I should be aware of or that I think I should know about or you think worthy of comment, be sure to send them. Um, I'm going to see if I can remember next week. A long time ago, I was doing a thing about really good and really bad song lyrics and inviting people to send them in. So um, I remember that... Uh, I got reminded of that because I heard one of those songs recently and it reminded me of, it's a good song, but a terrible lyric. So in any event, that's it for me. I'm out of here. I will see you next week. You have just the best week you possibly can. Bye. <laughs>